Let me ask. Let me ask this question before we get started with uh, the actual. Let me ask this question. You know, one of the things that's uh, going on in my own personal life as I'm finishing up my um, doctorate degree, and uh, my final project is on how the pandemic has affected churches. Now, how many of you guys know that all the major denominations are experiencing a loss of young people? That the churches are shrinking in size, and young people have simply left. And that uh, what it appears to be from what I've been able to research is that during the pandemic, a lot of people have used that as an excuse to leave the institutional church. They're like, ah, and you know, they've left and they're not coming back. So I'm glad that you guys all came back. But let me ask you this question. How many of you in this room right now can say truthfully, Stanton, that you are under the age of 40? Raise your hand if you're under the age of 40. Okay, only our interpreter is under the age of 40. Yeah, right at 40, you know, right? Here's the thing. If you were able to see the statistics of the audience that our videos reach, the majority of our audience is, and I'm, I was surprised at this, how many were between the ages of 13 to 18 and how many of them were between the ages of 18 and 35. That makes up the majority of our audience. Between 13 and 35 is the majority of the audience that watches us. We are reaching the next generation. We're just, we've just changed how we do it. We're you, and they're not coming back to the old paradigm. They're not gonna sit in the pews. They're not even gonna sit in the 1980 chairs nor will they sit in the 2010 couches, okay? They're not gonna do that. They're now out there online and they're doing church in a whole new different way and God has blessed us during this pandemic to be able to reach them. So thank you for all of you because you guys are the ones who are supporting that. Without you guys, it would not be happening. So thank you, we appreciate that. You guys are reaching the next generation. Is that awesome or why? You know, that's the one thing that I'd always hoped for was that I would be able to pass on my faith to the next generation. And uh, you guys are making that all possible. All right, we're taking a look at the book of Daniel. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to start this officially. Are you ready, Deborah? All right. Deborah always says I play with my tie before I start the video. So I'll play with my tie a little bit. Okay. All right. Good morning, Open Door Ministries. And to all our friends and family on Facebook and YouTube, it's great to be back sharing the Word of God with you again today. We are starting... Uh, in the book of Daniel, we've done a couple of uh, sermons on this already. This is the third sermon on the book of Daniel. I've entitled this Holiness and Hope because those are the two main themes running throughout the book of Daniel. Uh, this one comes from chapter uh, two, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And I believe that this particular chapter, chapter two of Daniel, is the most misused and most abused chapter in probably all of the Bible. I've, had, I've seen so many different interpretations of this, and I believe that it is used incorrectly. And I'm going to try to put this back into context so that we can see how it should be used. Now, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, chapter 2, has 49 verses. I won't do all of them. But I want you to take a look at these pictures here. Can you see these? Okay. You may have seen pictures like this before. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. It's this image. It's made out of different metals, gold, silver, bronze, and iron. And you may have seen different pictures about this, showing all these different kind of things. They try to interpret the kingdoms it's supposed to represent. If you grew up in more conservative churches, if you grew up with, say, the evangelicals, the fundamentalists, people who teach dispensational uh, theology, they'll tell you that uh, we are down around the ankles right now in what they call the prophetic gap and that uh, it represents Rome and Rome fallen and all kinds of other things. And I believe that's misusing this particular text, and I'll explain why as we go on. Uh, you may have seen this if you grew up in a church that teaches dispensationalism. You may have seen charts like this. They're pretty crazy. Uh, trying to relate Daniel to uh, the vision of four beasts in the book of Daniel later on, and the vision of four beasts in the book of Revelation. They try to make Revelation and Daniel about the same thing, even though they're not, but they kind of force that interpretation. All right, so again, as I was saying, Daniel chapter two has 49 verses. I'm not gonna read them all, because I am aware there's a difference between a long sermon and a hostage situation. 
and most of you are too polite to get up and just walk out on me, so I'm just going to summarize this for you. It's a very famous story. Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of Babylon, has a disturbing dream. And so he's bothered by this dream, and he turns to his wise men, and he demands that his wise men not just interpret the dream, but they have to tell him what the dream was. He's like, if I tell you the dream, you're just going to make up an interpretation. But if you're really good at your job, if you know what you're doing, you'll be able to tell me what the dream was too. And the wise men, of course, say, well, nobody's ever done this before. And so he says, here's your choice. Okay? If you can tell me the dream, I will reward you. I'll promote you. I'll lavish all these wonderful gifts upon you. But if you can't, well, then I'm just going to kill you and your family. So there's your incentive. And so this means that Daniel and his friends come into danger because he's going to kill off all the wise men because they are unable to tell him the dream. So Nebuchadnezzar orders the execution of the wise men and their families. And this is the point where Daniel steps up. Daniel asks to see the king. And Daniel and his companions stop and they pray. So there's a long section of prayer in here where they're seeking God's wisdom during this time. What are we supposed to do? Daniel, through the agency of an angel, receives what the dream was and what its interpretation was. And so he goes and he praises God. He says, thank you for revealing this to me. And he goes and he reveals the dream and the interpretation to King Nebuchadnezzar. And the king stops and he just praises God. He says, truly your God is the one true God. And so Daniel is promoted at this particular point. And uh, he explains what the dream is. So Daniel and his friends, they're all promoted. But I think oftentimes when we talk about this particular passage, we totally miss the point of what this particular story is all about. We get so focused on this dream of the statue and that it's four kingdoms and trying to use it to predict the end times that we miss the point of the story. Because the point of the story isn't about prophecy, and it's not about the end of the world. Let me stop and make sure you got that one. This is not about the end of the world. For the, for the ancient Jewish mindset, there was no, the whole world's going to be destroyed. That was never part of the prophecies that they would say. They saw that there would be an end to their particular kingdom, the Jewish kingdom, and then it would move into the Messianic kingdom. There's no earth being destroyed in there. There's just a shift when finally God's kingdom is established on earth and would spread over the entire earth and God's kingdom would reign forever. But there was no this, let's destroy the whole earth stuff. That doesn't come about until much later. And it sort of shows up in the United States for some reason. I don't know why. The point of the story is really about a lifestyle for the diaspora. Now again, the Jewish people had been scattered. They had been scattered by the Assyrians. Later, they're scattered by the Babylonians. They're being moved around out of their homeland. They're all over the place. And so these stories were written with the point in mind of how do you maintain your Jewish identity? How do you stay a holy nation when you are literally surrounded by other nations that are, con that are pressuring you and oppressing you and are trying to get you to conform to their culture. So how to be holy. So that's one of the reasons of there. And if, again, the point that if you stay faithful to God, that God will be faithful to you and help you find favor. I talked about that in the introduction in the first, first sermon on this. Now, what I want you to do is focus on this idea that living a holy life helps you find favor with God. And I want to compare it to a different story. If we go all the way back to Genesis, we have the story of Joseph. And Joseph gets sold into slavery by his brothers, and he's taken to Egypt, and he gets thrown into jail. But he becomes known as a wise person who's living this holy life like he's supposed to, following God. And so he's known as an interpreter of dreams. And when you compare Genesis 41 and Daniel chapter 2, there's a lot of similarities because it's making the same point that even in a foreign land, even in a foreign culture, if you stay faithful to God, you will find favor with your oppressors. So we can see in Joseph, uh, the Joseph story, Genesis 41, that Pharaoh has a dream, and it's a disturbing dream, and he needs the interpretation. Daniel chapter 2, the king has a dream. It's a disturbing dream, and he needs the interpretation. Nobody's able to interpret it in the Joseph story. 
Nobody can reveal it in the Daniel story. So the Daniel story sort of one-ups it a little bit. Not only does he need the interpretation, they've got to be able to tell what the dream was too. And there's a threat that goes with it. Now, Dan now Joseph's in jail, and he'll get out if he can interpret it. But Daniel will be put to death if he can't. Joseph interprets the dream. Daniel reveals and interprets the dream. God is exalted. In both of these stories, first in the Joseph story, Pharaoh says, indeed, the God of Joseph is the correct God. He's the better God, and he worships God. And in the Daniel story, Nebuchadnezzar says the same, says the same thing. Surely the God of Daniel, that's the one true God, and begins to worship God. And that's really the point of both of these stories, is that God is the sovereign God. God is the superior God. You are worshiping idols. You are worshiping false gods. Let us show you the real God and then it changes them, and they praise the one and true God. And so this is sort of this idea that carries throughout all of these stories in the Old Testament, especially when they're in bondage to Egypt, in bondage to the Babylonians, that when you find yourself in this situation, when you find yourself being oppressed, when you find yourself in a foreign culture, stay faithful, you will show who the real God is, and it will change your oppressors. All right, what about the dream? Everybody's like, well, but what about the dream? I heard, I heard, you know, and that there's going to be these kingdoms, and we get down to the toes, and they're, they're toes of iron and clay, and this all means something. And how many of you guys have actually heard different interpretations about this dream and how it relates to the future and things going on? Anybody? Oh, Mike over there has, great. Right? Oh, Stanton. All right. So let's actually talk about the dream. So what we see in Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 through 35 Daniel reveals what the dream is. He says, you were looking, O king, and lo, there was a great statue. The statue was huge. Its brilliance extraordinary. It was standing before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of that statue was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. I want to stop right there for a second. I've heard a lot of sermons talk about, oh, well, the feet, that was iron and clay mixed together, which makes it weak, so it wouldn't be able to stand. That's not what's in the language here. If you go back to the original language and it talks about clay, the word being used is tile, ceramic tile. So this is iron feet that has ceramic tiles decorating it. That'll become important later when we get to some other parts of this. But that's what it is. It's not iron that has been mixed together with clay and then, then either forged or baked. It's iron that has been decorated with tile, which was common, by the way, in the Persian period. So just, I want to make that little point clear. And as you looked on, a stone was cut out, not by human hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So here we have the statue. It's made of different materials. A stone comes. It strikes it. The whole statue is falls apart, and then the stone grows to become a great mountain and fills the whole earth. So how do we interpret this? Well, we got to interpret it in context. And this is why I think this passage is so misused and so abused. It's because we constantly just pull it out of context and try to get it to fit into other places where it doesn't belong. All right. And I think probably the best way to do it is maybe read the next couple of verses because Daniel says this was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. So if there's an interpretation to be had, why not take the one that's already there in the Bible? You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory, and to whose hand he's, he has given human beings wherever they live, the wild animals of the field and the birds of the air, and whom he has established as a ruler over them all, you are the head of gold. After you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, 
and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the whole earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, just as iron crushes and smashes everything. It shall crush and shatter all of these, as you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. It shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the strength of iron shall be in it, as you saw the iron mixed with the clay. As the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall this kingdom be left to another people. It shall crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever." So what we see is a series of four kingdoms and then the stone that removes them all, destroys them all, and establishes an eternal kingdom. Four kingdoms and then the establishment of an eternal kingdom. That's an important point because that shows up in a lot of our Old Testament writing and it shows up in other places as well. It shows up in Persian writings, it shows up in Greek writings. So the original audience would have been very familiar with this. How do we interpret this in context? Well, just as you saw that a stone was cut from the mountain, not by hands, and that it was crushed, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has informed the king what shall be hereafter. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Remember that phrase, the dream is certain, and its interpretation is trustworthy. That becomes important just a little bit later. The point of the dream is not about predicting the future. Remember that Daniel is not among the prophets. He's not listed as a prophet. He's in the writings. They recognize these as folklore and legendary stories that were written to encourage people. And so what we're looking at here is a certain genre of writing. And why are they making these supposed predictions if they were written after the fact? There's a reason for it. First off, these four kingdoms that we're seeing, and they're not named what they are, we just know that there's four kingdoms. It presents the kingdoms of this world as transitory, just temporary. They don't last forever, but they're also degenerating. It was a very common idea in both Persian and Greek thought that there were four metals, gold, silver, bronze, and iron, and each one was inferior to the next. And they used these to describe certain time periods. We're familiar with it. Some of us have probably heard things like the golden age of television or the golden age of movies, that that was the best time. And then, well, then, yeah, I've heard it related to comic books, the golden age of comics, and then the silver age of comics, right? We even have it today. We just had the Olympics on TV. What kind of medals did they pass out? First place you got gold, second place you got silver, third place you got bronze. I'm guessing if they were handing out medals for a fourth place, they would have been of iron because this is something that goes all the way back to ancient times. And so the statue is representing not only these temporary kingdoms, but each one is inferior to the other, not in the amount of power they have, not in the amount of territory they have, but it's moral character that it's degenerating. Each successive kingdom morally becomes worse and worse. Each kingdom becomes worse and worse morally, and that we're doomed to failure, that eventually all these kingdoms are gonna just fail until God's kingdom comes along and establishes itself. That's what this is talking about. It also presents the kingdom of God as coming, that we are in this period where we're still dealing with the kingdoms of the world one after another that God's kingdom is coming on the way, this stone cut without hands, this stone that will become a great mountain, it's coming, that this is a perfect kingdom, that it's destined for victory and that it is eternal. It will not be left to another generation. Once it is established, it will continue. It won't go to another people, it won't be replaced by something else. It will be an eternal kingdom that lasts forever. So the message they're trying to give to the people who are hearing this story is have hope. 
God's kingdom will be victorious. Yes, you are being oppressed right now at this moment, and it looks bad, but just wait. Because all these kingdoms, Babylon and all the rest of them, they're just temporary. Have hope. God's kingdom is on the way, and it will win. This is a message of be holy and have hope. All right, so let's take a look at misusing this. Here's some pictures here. I put a couple of them up there. Most of you have probably seen this or heard this, that the head of gold is Babylon. That's an easy one because Daniel says it outright. It's you. It's your Babylon. Now, a lot of people decide that the second one is uh, Persia or the Medo-Persian Empire, you might have heard it's called, the Medo-Persian Empire. There's a reason why they say that. They say that the third empire to come was Greece, that they were predicting, that Daniel predicted before Greece even existed, that the Greek empire would raise up, and that the last empire was Rome, that Daniel also predicted the future and that it's going to be Rome. And then if you look at the other picture there, you'll see the prophetic gap because what happened? Rome fell. And so they're saying, well, we're kind of in this church age. It's this prophetic gap. We haven't gotten down to the feet yet. We're kind of stuck at the ankles. We've been stuck at the ankles for about 2,000 years. And we're just waiting for the toes to come. And I've heard all kinds of crazy stuff about the toes. I've heard, well, if you were back in the 70s, if you were alive then, you heard that the toes represented the revived Roman Empire. So it had to come out of Europe. And that it was the European common market. That as soon as they got to 10 nations within the European common market, that was the end of the world and expect the rapture and the whole world to you know, blow up and then Jesus is going to come. And of course, that didn't happen in, in the 70s and the 80s. So now we're just kind of told it's going to be a revived uh, Roman Empire coming out of the Western Europe and there'll be 10 nations in it. If you read the Left Behind series, then you know, they're going to divide the world up into 10 different sectors. So they keep trying to put interpretations on this that I don't believe are supported by the text. And I'll tell you why in just a second here. But there's a lot of crazy stuff you'll see in this. I think they're misusing this text. They're trying to make it predictive when it wasn't. All right, so let's use the correct text correctly. We need to hold the text to sound interpretive principles, which I'm always saying we've got to keep it in context. So how do we keep it in context? We have to look at the genre of writing. What kind of writing was it? Was it poetical writing? Was it a narrative story? Was it apocalyptic? What kind of writing was it? How did the original audience understand it? And this is the biggest issue. See, it's not how do we, as 21st century Westerners, read this text and understand it. It's how did the ancient people during the Seleucid Empire understand this? And how would they have interpreted this? because it was written to them. And so we have to use their interpretation. And how does it fit into the book overall? And this is always a big issue, especially when we're dealing with issues of prophecy and we're talking about dispensationalism and things like that. They have a tendency to take passages of scripture out of the context of the entire book and try to fit them together and say, well, this one looks like that one, so they must be the same thing. And that's not always true. So we have to see how it fits in the book overall. So when we talk about genre, this is folklore. It's designed to teach us a lesson. Daniel was a legendary character designed, and his stories were designed to teach us a lesson. When we talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which we'll do next week, they're legendary characters designed to teach us a lesson. This is not about predicting the end. This is not prophecy. This is not about trying to tell us what's going to happen and establish some kind of timeline for the end of the world. It has nothing to do with that. It's not predictive at all. How did the original audience understand this? Well, it was written during the Seleucid Kingdom. And we actually have Greek writers of that time period. This is one of them. Uh, Hesiod describes four metallic generations, gold, silver, bronze, and iron. And he, in his history of the world, inserts another generation in there of the titans between the bronze and the iron ones. The idea of four kingdoms was common in Persia and Greece. And they divided all of history into four mighty kingdoms, right? The best one, the golden age. And it might include more than one kingdom. It was more of a time period. And then another time period that was inferior, the silver age. And then another one that was inferior to that, the bronze age. And then always, always the last one, the iron one. It was always considered the terminal time period. And guess what? Every generation believed they were in it. 
They always believed that we were as, at the point where it can't get any worse. Oh, you know, if you look back at the past, it was so wonderful and terrific, but you look now, it's so horrible. And even today we do that. Here in the United States, we look back to 1950s America. We go, oh, that was the golden age for America. We had won World War II. We were an industrial superpower. Everything was wonderful. We had prayer in schools and everything was perfect. Not. We had major segregation. We had McCarthyism. We had extreme wealth and poverty. It was not the best of times. And by the way, you're, if you were rich, your taxation rate was 90%. So, you know, but we like to look back in the 1950s, you know, for those of you who are old enough to live in the 1970s, you looked at, you watched the show Happy Days as it looked back at the 1950s, you know, what a wonderful time. And of course now, you know, every generation beats up on the generation that comes after it. I read an article the other day, it was talking about why have millennials left the church? Maybe because we treat them so poorly. Every time, every time you hear a boomer talk about a millennial, it's like, oh, they're so entitled, they're snowflakes, participation trophies. But maybe they just got tired of hearing this nonsense from the pulpit and walked out, saying, if you're going to beat me up, why am I going to stay? What is it about every generation feels the need to haze the one after it? Because this goes all the way back. You can go back to letters and writings and newspaper articles and opinion pieces written back in the 1700s. And they'll tell you, you know, this new generation is entitled and spoiled and, you know, they don't have any responsibility, blah, blah, blah. We just say that about every generation because we always believe we're the terminal generation. We always believe we're at the worst, lowest point possible. And, of course, we always prove them wrong. The type of prophecy that we see in this, this idea that he's predicting these four kingdoms to come, this type of prophecy is to establish credibility that if the prophecies are correct in predicting the events which are already in the past from the perspective of the readers reading it at the time it's written, it's to underscore the certainty of the events to, to happen overall. So he says the interpretation is sure, so we know that this is what's going to happen. It's just a way of saying God's in control. Writing, writing from this perspective, taking past events, putting them in the mouth of a legendary character, predicting them, into the future, supposedly, is a way of just saying God's in control of history. And you need to understand it as that. This is a way of saying God's in control. The four kingdom structure was used to structure time and present the current age as the low point with the imminent expectation of God's intervention. During the Persian period, the prophet Zechariah used this four periods of history as well. During the Persian period, Zechariah used it as four horns. And we would identify those four horns during Zechariah's period as the Egyptians and the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians because Zechariah lived during the Persian period. So that was considered the low point and God's return was imminent. So by the time we get to Daniel, it's now the Greeks, the Seleucid Empire, and so we have the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians and then the Greeks with the divided empire between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. And they would have considered that the low point. But by the time we get to Daniel, I mean, not Daniel, by the time we get to Revelation, now we have the Romans. And so when we have four beasts that come up representing four time periods, guess who's at the low point now? The Romans. And so this is just a common structure, this four that we see over and over again and that the four is always supposed to be the low point, and that God's kingdom is always just around the corner about to happen. Because it's always giving this message of hope. Yes, it looks really bad right now. We know we're at the low point. God's coming. But they're not all the same. The four horns of Zechariah are not the same four kingdoms as the four kingdoms of the statue. They're not the same kingdoms as the four beasts in Revelation. The four is just a structure that we used. So how does it fit into the book overall? Well, why don't we look at the book of Daniel and see how Daniel interpreted these four kingdoms. 
Daniel presents Babylon as the first kingdom. He says, you, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory, and to whose hand he has given beings wherever they live, the wild animals of the field and the birds of the air, and whom he has established as ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. That's the easy one. Babylon, the head of gold. Boom, done. So Daniel presents Babylon as the first kingdom. Daniel presents the Medes as the second kingdom. Now, if we want to throw Rome in there, if we want to misinterpret this scripture, we got to take the Medes and the Persians and stick them together and call it the Medio Persian Empire. Now, here's kind of the strange thing about talking about the Medes, because very little is known about them. There's not a lot of history about them. We know that they came from the area of Iran, that they ruled a certain area, which included Jerusalem for a short time. Very little history about them. And they were quickly overrun by the Persians, but they did exist at some point. In fact, if you look at Daniel, we'll see that in Daniel chapter 5, it says that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. Now, the Chaldeans and the Babylonians are the same thing. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So the second kingdom mentioned in Daniel are, is the Median kingdom, the Medes. By the way, again, as I told you in the very introductory sermon, introduction to Daniel, that sometimes there seems to be some historical inaccuracies. We can't find any trace of anybody named Darius the Mede. They've tried to make him into somebody else. They picked a character and said, well, we think it's him, but they don't have good strong evidence for it. But in Daniel, the Medes would be the second kingdom. Daniel presents the Persians as the third kingdom. In the third year of King Cyrus of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. The word was true, and it concerned a great conflict. He understood the word, having received understanding in the vision. That's in Daniel chapter 10. So we see three kingdoms already named in the book of Daniel. So these would be most likely for the three kingdoms talked about in the statue. So who's the fourth kingdom? I say it's the Greek Empire. And if you look at mainstream theologians and progressive theologians, they'll agree with me. Unfortunately, our evangelicals and fundamentalists do not because they tend towards dispensationalism and they need it to be Rome and they need to add in a prophetic gap and they need to have a revived Roman Empire. That's reading a lot of stuff into it that's not part of this book. But I would say it's the Greek Empire, specifically the Ptolemaic and Seleucid Empire. Why would I say that? Because that's the empire they were living in when the book was written. That's the one they were being persecuted under when the book was written. And so the original audience would have said, they're talking about this empire. We're being persecuted. They are defiling our temple. This is obviously the worst kingdom ever. We must be the terminal one. This must be the end of time as we know it. And God's kingdom is about to happen. And so they would have had hope for it. it. It would have been the very current empire they were living in. So putting it all together for you, the dream structures Jewish history. It sets the Seleucid Empire with the persecution going on and with Antichius IV who would desecrate the temple as the low point of their history. And so he's encouraging them, stay faithful, right? Have hope. God's intervention and establishment of the kingdom is imminent. It's about to happen. That's the message he's giving in this dream. All right, so I put this chart up here. Again, I'm talking about misuses of this particular passage. There, there you see the uh, image from Daniel chapter 2 again. There's a bunch of other stuff in there, different animals. And they're taking these from all over the place. You'll see dates all over, right? And down at the bottom, you finally see 1843. This comes from uh, the Millerites who were alive during that particular time period. By interpreting it in their particular fashion with all these animals and this and that and trying to piece them all together like a jigsaw puzzle just because they look the same, they must be the same. They came up with a date that around 1843, it finally got adjusted to 1844. In 1844, the rapture is going to happen. We're all out of here. The world's going to end. It's known as the great disappointment because so many people bought into this and it didn't happen. 
What will the 1970s bring? Inflation. This is uh, from a religious publication. This is from the Watchtower Tract Society. This is the Jehovah's Witnesses. They had figured out, looking at all the Daniels and all the Revelation animals and this and that and all that kind of stuff and adding up numbers and doing all this kind of crazy stuff, that the world was going to end in 1975. 1975. Gerald Ford was president, wasn't he? Had Nixon resigned by that time? <laughs> Maybe they saw Nixon's resignation as the end of the world. I don't know. But again, that's not what this text is meant to do. This text is not there to, pre to predict the end of the world, and all it does is leads to one prediction after another that is incorrect because we read into it. We're using it for the wrong thing. 1980s, countdown to Armageddon. Hal Lindsey. Do you know the rapture happened in 1988? 1988, that was the end. Both Chuck Smith and Hal Lindsey Picked 1988. Totally wrong. 88 reasons why the rapture will be in 1988. That was quickly followed by his follow-up book, Rapture Report 1989, 1990, 1991, 1992, and 1993, when he stopped publishing his updated rapture report. He just added a year every year. But again, it's all based upon, let's take this passage from Daniel and this passage from Revelation, and we'll make them the same things. Let's take this passage from Zechariah over here. Let's take this passage from Malachi and this passage from Isaiah. And, and they sort of, it's not the way that it worked. You can't take these out of context. When you do, you misuse them. Harold Camping, 1994 was his first prediction. Totally wrong. Maybe you remember this one. This is a little more recent, 10 years ago. Judgment Day, May 21st, 2011. And then he died. That's not the way the Bible works. The Bible has no established timeline. The Bible says no one knows the day or the hour except the Father. So as soon as somebody tells me this is when it is, I'm like, no, it's not. Can I tell you a little secret? May 20th, the evening of May 20th, I didn't do the dishes that night just in case. Hedge my bets a little bit. <laughs> All right, so knowing all of this, seeing all of this, it's interesting, you know, we get all this craziness with all these timelines and all these predictions and all this kind of stuff, but the important part is, how does it relate to me here and now? What am I supposed to do with all this? So let's take a look at that. Neither Daniel nor Revelation predict a date or give a timeline. If you go online, and I've talked about this before, there's a hashtag out there about rapture anxiety. And it's people sharing their stories about how they would come home and they had, been gr you know, they had grown up always being told about the rapture and it's any minute, it's going to happen any minute and you don't want to be left behind. If you're left behind, all these terrible things are going to happen to you. You're either going to have to take the mark of the beast or have your head cut off, all this stuff. And it's all these people sharing their stories where they would come home sometimes and they wouldn't immediately see their parents there and they would have panic attacks that they had missed the rapture, that their parents were gone, and they didn't have true, sincere belief, and they got left behind. Or my favorite one is about the person who they wrote their little personal story. Time changed. They didn't change their clock. And so they showed up to, uh, to church an hour early, and nobody was there. And they broke down out front of the closed doors of the church because they thought they had missed the rapture. People literally having psychological distress. And some people, you know, they're talking about, I still have this. I still worry about this, that I'm going to miss it. Stories about mothers killing their children because they thought they missed the rapture. It's horrible. There's no timeline. That's not what any of these things do. And we need to stop using and misusing these texts like this. Both Daniel and Revelations encourage the reader to stay faithful and give us hope. The message is the same. Whether you're living under, under the Persians in Zechariah's time, or you're living under the Seleucids of Daniel's time, or you're living under Rome in Revelation's time, the message is the same. Stay faithful. Don't give up. 
Yes, the world is persecuting you, but the world system is temporary. It will pass. God's kingdom will be eternal. Stay faithful to God's kingdom. God's kingdom is eternal. And if you stay faithful, you will, God will stay faithful to you and you will actually find favor within the culture that's trying to oppress you. It's the same message. Here's hope. God's kingdom is around the corner. Remember, empires rise and fall. Egypt rose to a high point and fell. The Assyrians, high point and fell. The Medes, the Persians, Babylonians, the Greeks, Rome, Britain, the British Empire once, the sun never set on the British Empire. They, they ruled all over the world, rose and fell. America will rise and fall. And eventually there will be something else. But only God's kingdom is eternal. And so we have to ask ourselves, where does our allegiance lie? With what is temporary and transitory? Or with the eternal kingdom of God? The end of the world is not imminent. I don't care what particular date they give you. If they tell you that the rapture is going to happen because there's some comet or there's going to be another solar eclipse and it's another blood moon, don't believe them. Why do I believe the end of the world is not imminent? Because that's not what they're talking about in the Bible. Did you notice something about that stone cut without hands, that mountain that filled the whole earth? It filled the earth. God's kingdom is here and now. It's meant to be here. God's kingdom has already been established. Christ established God's kingdom. When Jesus came, he announced, the kingdom of God is now here. The kingdom of God is at hand. You can literally reach out and touch it. That's how close it is. It's here and it's now. And it may not seem like it, but we are living in God's kingdom now. Christ has established it. We are living in it. But are we living it out? Before the year 1850, the prevailing theological teaching was that as Christians, we needed to build the kingdom of God, and once the kingdom was fully realized, Jesus would come back and claim it. That's when he would come back. After 1850, and the writings of Darby and Schofield, establishing dispensationalism, Theology changed. That Jesus would come back violently and destroy the earth and then set up his kingdom. Do you see the difference between these two? I subscribe to the older theology that it is our job, that the kingdom is already here. Christ has already established it and now we build it. And when we have fully realized it, he will come back as our king to claim it. I believe that's a better interpretation. That's mine. I realize some people interpret it differently, and that's okay. Feel free to share that in the comments. It's okay. We can talk about it and discuss it. The end of empire has already happened. With the death of Jesus and the establishment of the church, the kingdom is here. Empire has already fallen. The kings of this world, they don't have power over us. Oh, they can kill us. They can persecute us but they don't have true power over us, the very destiny of our souls. The kingdom is now here. Remember these things. We owe our allegiance to the kingdom. That's the message of Zechariah. That's the message of Daniel. That's the message of Revelation. We owe our allegiance to the kingdom and to nothing else. And no matter how much the culture around you tries to get you to conform and change, to move away from being faithful to God, to move and worship other idols, we must stay faithful to the kingdom even if it costs us our lives. We must live according to kingdom values. Well, what are those kingdom values? Love God, love your neighbor. Those are the values of the kingdom. That's how you live that holy Christian life, to love God and love your neighbor. Our faithfulness, and this is the message again, our faithfulness, our example, 
will lead to the expansion of the kingdom. Think about how many young people are walking away from the church today. Why? Because of what they see inside that church. They see division. They see strife. They see hatred. They don't see love. They see people demonizing other people. They see the way that women are treated. They see the way that the LGBT community is treated. They don't see love, and so they're walking away. If we want young people to catch the faith, then we need to be better examples and live the faith. Be the kingdom. It's here. We're in it. We're to live it out. And it's got to start here, as I always say. If you want to build the kingdom, start in your own local body. I could even back that up a little bit more. You want, us, you want to live the kingdom? Start in your own life. Stop worrying about what everybody else is doing. Because that's what Jesus said, right? Don't worry about the speck in your brother's eye. Take the log out of your own. So go home and deal with yourself. Stop worrying about everyone else. Put your own house in order. Put your own church in order. Build the kingdom right here in this church. And then when this church shines forth as a light, as an example, people will want to catch it. People want to become part of it, and we expand the kingdom that way. With that, we're going to move into a time of prayer, and there'll be some time for contemplation and meditation. So let me now pray for everybody. Heavenly Father, forgive us for where we have not been the kingdom, where we seem to be so caught up in what everybody else is doing, where we want to fix everybody else but not ourselves. Forgive us, Father, for examining the speck in our brother's eye and not the log in our own. Lord, let us cry out with the psalmist who wrote, Create in me a clean heart. Search me, examine me, O oh Lord. Father, I just pray for the, the people here with me present today. I know many of them are struggling with uh, elderly family members. Many of them are struggling with health issues. Father, we just ask that your Holy Spirit just go out to give them strength, to give them endurance during this time, to give them encouragement during this time. Father, let us claim the hope that's within the message of your word, that your kingdom is here, that the world can change, that let this be the terminal generation, let this be the generation that's the low point, and that we move upward into your kingdom from there. Father, I pray for the many people who are watching this right now. It's, it's sometimes challenging. I know moving through my own personal spiritual journey as I have to re-examine all my old beliefs, that it can be difficult, brings up a lot of emotions, brings up anxiety and fear sometimes. But Father, I just ask that your Holy Spirit will allow them to rethink what they were taught, to consider the words that I have for them today. May your Holy Spirit guide them in truth. And Father, if I'm in error, guide me in truth. Lord, I just pray all these things in your name. Amen. Let me close out today's service with this. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So for this week, that's a wrap. Until next time, go in peace and may God bless all of you.